give it about another minute for uh, anyone else to come in. Greetings. Good morning. My name is John Mark Walker. I'm the Gloucester Community Leader for Red Hat. Uh, apparently there will be a live translation of this going on while I'm speaking. I've never done that before, so please bear with us. If I speak too fast and you, you're not listening to the live translation, feel free to raise your hand and say, you're speaking too fast, slow down, and that's fine. Um, also, bear in mind that uh, this is my first time speaking without like a wireless microphone, and I'm very used to running around on the stage while I'm speaking. So if you see me do like this or like this, it's because I'm not used to standing still. So please forgive me. Um, also, I had about five Caprainus uh, last night, so uh, if, if I seem a little loopy, it's probably because I am. You know, sorry. Um, so yes, come on in, come on in. Come on in. It was never about innovation. So as the as the slides say, it was never about innovation, and I'll get into why I called the talk to that, uh, because you hear a lot of people talking about innovation, but you kind of wonder what is it exactly that they're talking about, because I don't think they really know. Um, so that one of the things I want to get into today is. What is innovation? What does it really mean exactly to say that you're innovating or that you're doing something innovative? Uh, and then we can talk about how that plays within the open source world. You know, what were the keys to the open source victories that we've been seeing over the last 10 years? And it's been a very steady progression of open source victory in the data center, which I'll get into in more detail. Uh, and then after we go over the lessons that we learned from open source, we can talk about how do we apply those lessons to the cloudy world? I'll pause here and let people get in. Thank you. Um, whenever I think about innovation, I always think about, or I always refer back to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. How many of you have read the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Oh, perfect, okay, so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, when it, when, when it describes, when Douglas Adams describes the act or the art of flying. And it's essentially the art of learning how to throw yourself at the ground and miss. Uh, maybe because you distract yourself at the last minute. And that's kind of what I think about when I think of the word innovation. You know, innovation isn't necessarily something you do or you try to do. It's something that happens along the way when you care very passionately about doing something. And I think Douglas Adams really sort of nailed that aspect when he talked about learning to fly. When you look at the, the, the sort of the Zen, um, the art of Zen and how Zen applies to daily life, in, in, in especially when you think of sometimes the best way to achieve something is to not try to achieve it. And when you think of, in this example, the pursuit of happiness, the key to reaching happiness is to not try to reach happiness. Happiness is something that, go, that comes along with doing the right things. And that's really what I want to emphasize here is how Innovation happens when you take the time to set things up in a way that produces this sort of, when you do the right things from the beginning, when you establish rules and precedents for everyone to abide by, then you can achieve innovation, not because you tried to, because it's something that happened because you did the right thing in the first place. And then of course, we, we should look up the, the definition of innovation as we find it uh, on Wikipedia. What is innovation? Wikipedia gives the, I, I personally, I much like the, the examples from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy uh, and, and thinking from a Zen point of view, but, but sure, let's, let's have the dictionary definition. It's producing something new, exciting, um, that, that benefits everyone. So great, what do we get out of innovation? It's funny, when, uh, back in the 90s, and I'm showing my age here, uh, how long I've been involved in this sort of thing, in the Linux world, in the open source world. Whenever Linus was asked what he wanted to achieve with Linux, he, his answer, and it was kind of a joke, was world domination. 
And it was funny, haha, because at the time, Linux was this tiny little project, and you know, it was gaining momentum, but no one ever expected it to, at least most people didn't expect it to reach the heights that it has reached now. Uh, and yet, now we can see that over time, it's become less and less of a joke. It's not really a joke to talk about Linux and world domination, because frankly, if you look at all the open source in the world today, it kind of is world domination in action. Sometimes it's difficult to uh, remember just how far we've come and how much uh, open source has conquered the world. And sometimes we have to pause and reflect on that and really think about where we are today. Imagine 15 years ago, you know, where you thought that open source would lead us. Would, did you imagine 15 years ago that so many people around the world would be paid to work on open source software? Did you think that you know, 15 years ago that so much of the world's economy would run on open source software? I don't think many people really imagined that scenario 15 years ago. So when it's funny to go back and read those old interviews with Linus when he talked about world domination, especially when you consider where we are today, because where we are today is world domination. Um, and it's kind of interesting to see how we got here. How did we get to the point where open source is such a critical piece of infrastructure that the world runs on? You know, is it because people sought to innovate? Or is it because we set up this system of rights and freedoms and this managed ecosystem in a way that sort of led to innovation happening? Let's reflect a bit on what we mean by world domination. And let's reflect on where open source is today and what lessons we can learn from that. If you look at the total open source ecosystem in the world, uh, you really have to, it's, it's mind boggling. I would love to see some young economic student do a study on just how much of the world's economy depends on open source software. Because when you think about it, literally trillions of dollars around the world are either traded via or, or directly uh, reflect revenue from open source software and open source services. It's, it's a massive amount of money in the world that now is invested in open source software in, by some means. Imagine, if you will, if for some reason all the open source software disappeared overnight. Imagine what would happen, what would be the scenario? And when you think about it in those terms, it would be a massive disruption to our, the global economy. It would be you know, riots, famine, uh, the banking system would collapse, all sorts of calamities would transpire because of if, if there were no open source software and it disappeared overnight. And when you think about it in those terms, it shows you just how much we depend on open source and just how far it's come in sort of defining the world that we live in today. And I'd like to, again, I would love to put a real dollar figure on that just to show the total amount of our economy that depends on open source software. I think it would be a very eye-opening number for people to really see. Let's also consider who are the big success stories of the last 10 years? Who are the companies that have really made a big name globally in the technology space? Who are these companies and how did they get there? Well, you can see here I, I put some logos of companies that have grown very large over the last you know, decade. And they all have one thing in common. All of them have an infrastructure that is very much dependent on open source software. These are all guys who are running Linux, they're running uh, other open source databases, other open source data management systems, they're running, their infrastructure is almost completely independent on open source software. You notice something else, the big winners of the last decade, they did not, they did not bet their business on proprietary software. They bet their business on open source. And you have to ask yourself, why did they do that? You know, the big question is, what was, what was it that led to them choosing that path? Was it price? Was it, uh, was it innovation? Was there something else at work here? What, what was it that led them down this path? And I think if we, if we learn lessons from that, then we can sort of derive other lessons to apply to where we're going with cloud computing. Whenever you talk about open source software and, and how the, the system works and why people are doing it, uh, sometimes you get some confused looks from people who are wondering what you're talking about. Um, and a lot of times all you hear is, well, customers don't really care about open source, meaning that what customers really care about is does this stuff work? 
And if it does, I'm going to use it. And the thinking goes that the customers don't care if it's open source or not. They're just going to pick whatever works. Well, that's actually not true. We, we have enough data now, and we've been at this enough years to know that customers have many choices. People have many choices of different things, that they, different software pieces they can use in the data center. And so we've had, you know, since 98, I, I use that line to demark when open source really became important to most people. But since 1998, customers have had many choices of things they could do. And it's very clear that the customers who chose the open source way have benefited tremendously. It, it's all about the users uh, learning the benefits of open source and applying it to their business. Those are the people that won. So yes, I do think customers, users actually care about open source. They care because that's they voted with their wallets in that direction. And the key is to not deny that or dismiss it, it's to understand why. Also, whenever I talk to some executives about open source, uh, the other thing that comes up is, but nobody's getting paid for this. Who's getting paid for it? I hate that question because I, I, I think it's pretty obvious at this point that millions of people around the world are getting paid to either deploy, use, or develop open source software. It's pretty clear at this point that the open source ecosystem includes a lot of money, that it, it, or consists of a lot of money uh, trading hands uh, between users and developers and, and companies in the ecosystem. To, at this point, this, this question is moot because yeah, I think everyone's getting paid to do this. I, you know, I think most people in this room are getting paid to work on open source software. Um, so I think, again, it just to drive the point home that the open source ecosystem does in fact uh, have, a large have a large impact on the global economy. So here's where we are today. We have massive success. We have, we have open source is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. Uh, we have world domination. Uh, we know it wasn't based on price because we know that customers, users have had many choices of what to use along the way. And most of the time, at least for those who are successful, they have chosen the open source path. So we know it's not just on price. There's, there's something else driving the activity. And we also know that open source today is very much a center of innovation. Look at, look at all the main areas of development in software today. Look at big data, look at cloud computing, look at operating systems, databases, data management. Every single one of these has an open source center of gravity. Look at the Hadoop ecosystem. Look at what's happening with OpenStack, CloudStack. If you're making software today and you ignore these ecosystems, you're a very stupid company. I think we can say that safely today. Uh, all the center, centers of innovation are around open source software. It's, it's not a, that's not a, that shouldn't be a controversial statement. That's just a statement of fact. Um, but the key is not sort of, I think that sort of, when you look at the innovation that's happening in those areas, I think it can kind of lead us down a false path. Because remember, innovation isn't something that we sought to do. It's something that happened along the way. Let's look at how we got where we are today. When you think back to the Free Software Foundation, the GNU project, and all the things that uh, came from that, I, I, I love to refer back to the four freedoms. And these were the four freedoms of, of software. And if you look at from zero to three, because we started zero, uh, the freedom to run the program for any purpose, freedom to study how it works, redistribute copies, and distribute copies of your modified versions. All these things are about you know, what the end user or developer can do. I think it's interesting to note that uh, open source, for the most part, was primarily a user-driven thing. We always like to talk about developers and what developers do, but honestly, I really think that when open source turned the corner, it's because users and customers decided that these were rules that were okay for them because it, it changed the dynamic. And I'll get into that in a bit more detail later. But it was all about evening the um, evening the, the power distribution between user and developer so that each party now had a, a say in the transaction. And each party was able to leverage that power to influence the direction that things would go. Previously, you had a vendor who made software and the customer or user accept that software 
And there really was, I mean, sure, there, was, there were conduits for the customer to say, hey, I would like to have A instead of B or C instead of D, but there was no active participation in that transaction. Open source completely flipped that, and free software completely uh, flipped that on its head to the point where the customer was just as important in the transaction as the developer. And in order for them both to sort of meet at a common ground, they both had to be participating equally. And that, I think, was the key lever to sort of guiding the direction of open source, and really that was the key to it being so successful, was this, this uh, leveling of the playing field. And so you look at what the keys were to open source success. Uh, the first thing, customer or user, end user driven. Uh, I've been working with developers in open source projects since the late 90s when I was at uh, VA Linux working on the, the sourceforge.net website. And there was a very early survey we did where we tried to determine why exactly developers participated in open source projects. And it was a very enlightening survey because the thing that became very apparent was the developers weren't participating out of a love of free software. They were not driven to participate in eco open, uh, open source ecosystems necessarily. They were driven to participate because that was where the users were. And it, it was very, very eye-opening for me because I always assumed that developers of open source projects were doing it because they cared very deeply about free software and open source. And I think there's a percentage of them who do care very deeply and participate because of that reason. But I think there was something else going on there. I think that's not the primary driver. The primary driver is, again, getting back to the four freedoms, users, end users, and customers said, this is a great thing, and they demanded their seat at the table. They demanded that they be given their due, that they be able to participate fully in the, in the transactions. Uh, and I think that was sort of the, that, that flipped the switch. Um, so I think ever since then, I've been thinking about this uh, in terms of what role does a developer play. And I think it's pretty clear at this point that developers have to play by, the, by these rules because that's where the users live. And if you want to reach users, you want people to actually use the stuff that you're producing, you have to participate in open source and free software ecosystems. So customer and user driven. Community driven. With the leveling of the playing field between producer and user comes this sort of new participation dynamic where, where all sides are participating in some way. Everyone has a job to fill. Everyone has a role to, to play in an open source project. And so community driven means that you know, everyone in the community, whether you're, you're a user, whether you're a documentation writer, whether you're a developer, you all sort of determine the outcome of the project. You work on the project collaboratively, you determine the direction of the project, and you drive it forward. And so this is, this is a new thing. This, before open source software, this didn't really exist in the software development world. This is a, very much something that came about in the late 90s, or I, I guess in the, in the 80s with the advent of the GNU project, but it just accelerated with the internet. And I think the third thing here is it's inherently more agile. When you get a level playing field, and everyone is participating in the project, this seems to be, this seems to give a much greater deal of agility to the end user, as well as to the developer uh, and the project overall than there was before. And I think it's this agility that produces these fast changes whenever you need them. This, this agility that allows end users to keep up with the technological world, the technological pace, uh, much more quickly than if they were dependent upon a proprietary vendor. This is the key. I think that the agility that comes from the rules that we set down with free software and open source, it's the agility that kills. Agility is the killer app of open source. It's what has led, it, in my mind, it is the biggest factor in the success of open source, probably more than anything else. Because when you look at all the technology pieces that make up the modern data center, how else are you gonna keep up with that if you're, unless you have you know, the rules defined by open source. How can you keep up with all the new software that's coming up? How can you keep up with the ability to integrate it into your existing systems if it's not open source? And I think the data and uh, the revenue speak very clearly that the only way to do this is if you have an open source infrastructure. So when you think of the winning pieces, it's agility and ownership. Ownership 
because everyone owns it. It's not just the, the domain of the producer, but it's also the domain of the producer and the user. So everyone owns it. And because of that, you have this massive agility that you didn't have before. Am I speaking too fast? Okay. So I like to, I always like to bring up this graphic when I look at our, our brave new open source world. It's not so new anymore. We, we actually have a lot of data behind this to show exactly why this is happening. But so I, I, I approach this issue from the point of view of a vendor producing software. I've been working in the software industry for many years. And so I've been a, an open source community advocate in all these companies. And so there are some things that always come up. Uh, just like the question before of who makes money from this stuff, to inver inevitably, whenever I work on a free software project, someone in the company, usually a sales guy, will say, I hate freeloaders. Our number one competitor in this market is the free stuff that we give away. We should stop giving away this free stuff so we can sell more of this other stuff. Um, and so I, I produced this slide over many years because I like to show that, again, leveling the playing field, everyone has a role to play, Freeloaders are very, very important in the grand scheme of things. And I, you know, I use the word freeloader as a joke because I don't think they're freeloaders, but I, I like to use that word just to tweak some people. Uh, when you look at the whole ecosystem of a software project, and again, going with the theme of it's not just about the producers, it's also about the users. If you produce something that people find valuable and they use it for free, what are they actually doing? Look at all the different ways that they can play a role in your project. Look at all the ways that uh, they can influence the direction of your project. And think of all the data that you're able to gather because you can see firsthand how these people use your software. And when you look at it from that point, you know, I, this is my great, this is a circle of life for open source projects, I guess. Um, because you can see that all these different layers where there are feedback loops, and if you maximize these feedback loops, then you can get much more activity uh, in your project uh, and you can go that way uh, because you have a large user base. The larger the user base, the more uh, ability you have to do other fun things uh, in your, with your project. And so you don't get to a large user base unless there are a lot of people using it for free. So whenever I talk to sales executives about why this is important, I always refer back to this slide because I think it, it's definitely important when you think about the, the grand scheme of things. But again, this is only possible because open source levels the playing field. If you didn't have the level playing field that comes from the rules uh, of playing in open source, you wouldn't be able to ha produce this dynamic. So in the end, agility wins. Agility is the killer app. And this agility only comes about because of the rules that we set down with first free software and then open source because of the four freedoms. Because we, because we determined that the best way to go about this is to have this managed ecosystem that lives by the four freedoms. And again, as I like to say, innovation was not the goal. It was just a very interesting byproduct of what we chose to do. Now we transition a little bit to Okay, I think we've established fairly uh, confidently that open source is definitely the winner, but why did it win? I think we have some data on that now. But how do we apply that to the future directions? How do we apply that to cloud computing? Where do we go with this stuff? And I think we have to think about you know, the open cloud or open hybrid clouds. Uh, how do we actually you know, one of the great perversities of the modern data center is that all this open source software is being used. And in many cases, it's being used to produce proprietary services. And again, if you look at the lessons of open source, is that necessarily the best path? Does that guarantee uh, this, does that path lead to the, the managed ecosystem that we've all come to, to know and enjoy? Um, I, I, whenever I talk about uh, uh, clouds and open source, I, I, you know, I, as Jim Zimlin says, they, they go together like peanut butter and chocolate, you know, and if you, if you're in the United States in the, in the 70s and 80s, there were, there were all these uh, 
their ads for this candy bar where you got your chocolate in my peanut butter, you got your peanut butter in my chocolate. And so, oh, this is really great. And so when I think of open source and cloud, I always think back to that commercial, which if you've never seen, you probably don't know what I'm talking about, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, so when I think of open source and clouds, I think they go together like peanut butter and chocolate. They're, they're inseparable. You, you, you can't have one without the other. Um, but so we all know that clouds are comprised of open source software. That's not the question. The question is, how do we get to the point where we have this managed ecosystem of open source services that is also based on open source infrastructure? What is the open hybrid cloud, or just what is the open cloud? When you really think about it, it comes down to three different layers. There is there are platforms, the open source platforms, the services, so the, it would, the services would need to be open source, and we can define what that means in a bit. And then the APIs have to be open. And that, that gets into some squishy territory, because what is an open API? But I think at this point, we can all boil us down to one simple word, data. When you look at APIs, when you look at services and platforms, when you think about what an open cloud means, what it really comes down to is what happens with the data. See, previously, when it came to open source software, we didn't have to worry about this component as much because open source came of age when we all had local storage, we all had local disks, or for the most part. Uh, and so the transparency or flow of data wasn't as much of a concern because until the last 10, 15 years, you know, no one was building these you know, cloud-based services uh, that, that, uh, uh, that you know, where every transaction was over a network, or at least it wasn't ubiquitous until you know, the last 10, 15 years. But now we have a situation where suddenly the flow of data becomes very important because everything is a transaction over a network. Everything is based in the internet, and all these services are cropping up on the internet. Uh, that you can only access via uh, their methodologies and, and their access uh, that they grant you. And so, the, the, again, the dynamic has shifted. Once again, we're back to this dynamic where users are down here and producers are up here, and producers define the rules, and we have to abide by them. And the whole premise of this talk is how do we switch that, just like we do with open source, so that you get a level playing field? How do we get a situation where the producers and the users are coming together in this managed ecosystem? So when you think about it, it's about data velocity. It's about, it's about the ability to, to move data into new contexts where it still has the same meaning. You know, for example, when you look at, just to take one uh, widely used service as an example, let's say you know, Facebook. You took your data on Facebook and you sucked down all your data and so now you have all your data, right? What do you, can you use it for anything? is what can you actually do with it? Again, it's not about the data itself as some atomic thing, it's about the data in context. It's about the flow of data. It's about where, what you can do with that data. Could you actually take that data and move it to a new service and have it be just as usable? And the answer, of course, is no, you cannot. Um, right now, we're in a situation where maybe you can get all your data, but it's not usable in a new context. And so you're dependent upon the service provider to open things up for you. And as um, I think there's a Red Monk analyst, uh, Red Monk is a, a, a market analyst firm based in the United States. Uh, one of the guys, um, uh, Stephen O'Grady, um, has said that data is the new currency. Uh, data is becoming more important, or in some cases more important than the actual software that helps to run it. And when I think of data, and the cloud and data and as it pertains to software development and software usage and building services, I like to make analogs to uh, economics. Because think about, it's kind of similar to money. I mean, data is a new currency. And when we look at money, it's kind of a similar dynamic because money at rest really is kind of useless. It doesn't actually do anything. When you think of on a macroeconomic scale, to make money useful, it has to be moving around. It has to be you know, it, transacting from one party to another. It has to be in motion. Data is very similar in that respect. If you just put data in cold storage, you're not actually using it for anything. It's not, being, uh, it's not doing anyone any actual good. Uh, just like if you keep money stationary, uh, like a lot of the banks are doing, uh, it doesn't have a positive impact on the economy. 
and when when data is is pushed into uh, a place where it doesn't actually do anything, it doesn't really you know give you the benefits that we get from you know all the sort of new services that are cropping up. So basically, the I guess the gist of this is anything that impedes the velocity or flow of data uh, restricts the open cloud. And so the key is how do you open that up and make it such that you know this doesn't happen. Because when you really think about it, when you think a lot of the, the network-based services that are around today and that seem to be growing, it's the new black box. It's the new proprietary system. Uh, again, I, uh, as I said before, one of the great perversities of this is that underneath that black, spot, black box is all open source and free software. You know, and how did we get to this point where we have all these proprietary services that have that are running on you know software that uh, that uh, that um, lives according to the, the four freedoms. But yet, here it is. It, I, I have no transparency into what happens to my data in many cases, um, at least on a service level. And when you talk about cloud computing, there are all these different layers. There's an infrastructure layer. There are, you know, there's the platform as a service layer where, where developers can use. There are in, any number of different layers that you can segment if you really want to. At the infrastructure layer, it's just about setting up virtual machines and doing whatever you want. And in those cases, it's not really a black box because you're making up all the services yourself. But when you're talking about using the automated services that a lot of these uh, companies deploy, then you're getting into the black box territory. You know, when you're using these services, do you have the freedom to actually move your service somewhere else? Do you have the freedom to change your service, to modify your service and redistribute? I think the answer is very clearly no. And so when I think about the new lock-in, it's about you know, everyone likes to talk about elasticity and the cloud and we're all in elastic computing now. But from my point of view, elasticity is not that elastic if you can only expand within one context. If you can't go beyond the context that they grant you, then I don't think that's very elastic. I don't think that's true cloud computing. And when you really think about it, you know, with, when you think about the new data lock-in, the new service lock-in, what does your service provider grant you? Do they grant you the ability to move and port your data to new contexts or new systems? Do they give you true service portability? Can you run their service without them? You know, or as I like to say, what happens if your service gets run over by a bus? Well, probably bad things because you don't have anywhere else to go. In fact, I have a uh, recent example of this. I. Uh, I was convinced by one of my colleagues to choose this uh, service uh, that, that was a question and answer forum for the Gluster community at gluster.org. And so against my better judgment, I went with them because they promised me lots of things like an open API and, and some other things. So I said, sure, I'll go with your service. Uh, and then of course, fast forward by a year and suddenly they're shutting down the service. What am I gonna do? And I now have a year's worth of questions and answers on this service that I cannot use. And sure, they gave me a data dump. So now I have a data dump, and if I want to recreate a service like it, I guess I can. But you see, I'm stuck now because my service provider is gone, I have the data, and all the users who came to depend on that service are now without it. So what do I do with that? This is a situation that I don't think you should ever have to face. I think there should be rules that are established so that when you choose a service provider, you, can, you have the ability to fire your provider at some point. Just like with open source, you have the choice to fire your vendor and continue to use it. I think we should have something similar with service providers. How, how many of you heard of a guy named Bob Young? <laughs> yes, Mad Dog. Uh, Mad Dog remembers Bob Young. Does anyone else remember Bob Young? All right, a couple of people. Bob Young was one of the, I don't know if he's a co-founder, but one of the very early uh, people involved in Red Hat. And in the late 90s, he was very fond of, of saying this thing that got very, uh, well, at the time it got annoying because he would say it all the time. But it, it's actually very uh, pertinent here. And it was, would you ever buy a car with the hood welded shut? And I think in most cases, the answer is obviously, well, no, you wouldn't because that would prevent you from actually changing anything on the car. And you'd, it means you'd depend on your dealer to do everything and you wouldn't be able to do anything yourself or you wouldn't be able to find an alternate third party. Well, I think that was, that, that was applicable in the days of 
you know, software uh, and living locally on your machine and the data living locally on your machine. But when you, go, when you look at sort of where we are with cloud computing, I think that question becomes, would you drive on a road that wouldn't allow you to choose your own route? Now, if, you, if many of us drive, uh, I like to drive by GPS in many cases, so I guess in, in my case this doesn't really apply to me because I just follow whatever the GPS tells me. Uh, but it's nice to know that if I want, I can go on a different road if I, if I choose to. And I, I, sort of, I like that analogy as it applies to you know, services that exist in the cloud. I think it's a better way to think about the problem. Now let's look again at our, our four freedoms and how this applies to cloud computing. I think we've established that you can use free software to build proprietary services. How, what needs to change with the four freedoms in order to change that dynamic and to once again level the playing field? What, what new rules do we need to live by in order to, uh, to level the playing field? Let's, let's define what the open cloud is and, and, and what it would actually mean to have an open cloud. I think I've, I've listed about five things here that uh, I think uh, apply to what an open cloud should be. And if you, I don't know if you can read the top one, but it says open data formats. Um, so open, for, open data formats are essential because if you have easy access to data, but it's all in a proprietary format, you're still dependent upon the service provider to grant you the access to data that you own. This is sort of, this above all else is, is, is why I care about this, because we live in a world where even the stuff that you legally have access to, you're still dependent upon someone else to grant you the ability to use it. Think about the data that you've, you've, that you've purchased, like songs, music, uh, other things. Uh, there are all sorts of examples where we have the access to the data, but for whatever reason, we, we have to rely on the service provider to unlock it for us. I, I, I find this very uh, disturbing. Um, let's look at interoperability. And what is interoperability? It, it, is it the ability to use, in my mind, it, it's the ability to use multiple services from multiple sources and being able to use them together and, and being able to bind them together and integrate them in ways that, that give me the ability to, to make new things. Service portability. I should be able to take a service and be able to move it to a new provider and still use it. I think this is a very basic thing that we do not have at this point, unless you're talking about you know, infrastructure and virtual machines. But anything above that, it's pretty much impossible at this point. We don't have anything that uh, even approaches this sort of federation of services that would allow us to move from one to the other. Open protocols and standards, uh, that, that one should be fairly obvious. Uh, any sort of data format should be a standard. Any kind of uh, protocol that we use to access the data should be an open standard. And finally, open source implementations. I've actually gone back and forth on this last one. Uh, at one time, I believed that we could have open data and open cloud running on proprietary software. I no longer believe that because I think it becomes too easy for someone adding proprietary later and then using it as leverage against the end user. So now I've, I've kind of gone over to the, the point of view that in order to guarantee your continuing freedom, you have to have an open source implementation in order to, to it's, it's sort of a, a, again, to level the playing field. The only way to truly level the playing field is to make rules that will uh, continue to assert uh, the rights that we have in the process. Once we see that, then the dynamic shifts again and the, uh, uh, and the producers you know, have the leverage over us and they can do whatever they want. The key is to institute these rules that everyone has to, to play by to guarantee that in the future we'll still have a level playing field. And so let's look at what does this mean in terms of the four freedoms? What do we actually need to change in order to, to shift that dynamic to a more level playing field. And I think when you go back and look at the four freedoms and you kind of look at it from the point of view of you know, living in a service provider world, how, what actually needs to change? And I actually noticed that in going through this, I only need to change, shift around a couple of words to do what I think would, would, um, would give us the result that we want. And when you look at it, I, I, I think in, in some cases I just add the word service. In some cases, I, um, I, you know, I only changed on a couple of things. And I think it's, 
that sort of switch, that maybe just tweaking the rules a bit, uh, tweaking the four freedoms, would, would lead to, you know, where we want to go. I think there are some people who ask, you know, why is this important? Um, just like in the open source case, there were people who asked, who's getting paid for this? How does this work? I don't think this, you know, they, thank you. Uh, I think it's very important. When you look at the results of open source, when we, the results that came about because we established these rules and guidelines very early that we all had to play by, uh, I think it led to very uh, impressive results. I think if we don't do that for the open cloud, then I think we'll have less impressive results. But also, we'll have a, uh, an unequal playing field in the cloud. And I think that's something we absolutely should work to avoid. Uh, I think if we, if we win, then I think everyone wins, uh, end users especially, because it means we're not, uh, we don't, we're not subjected to the tyranny of developers. Um, but it's really about producing managed ecosystems that can live for many years. And the only way to do that is to give all the, um, all the people who participate in the ecosystem a stake in the outcome. And that means basically sharing of power and making sure that everyone uh, can participate fully. So we know that agility and openness are very much tied together. One leads to the other. Uh, you can't really have true agility unless the platforms are open. And I've, I've defined what, what open is in this context. Ouch. <laughs> I didn't do it. <laughs> so you see, it was never about innovation. Uh, it's about freedom, ownership, and control. Who owns what? Who has a stake in what? Uh, who is able to participate fully? Uh, and who is, you know, who is the gateway to access? If there are gateways to access, then you really don't have a level playing field. And finally, the one thing I, I love to, love, the one point I love to drive home, the hippies had it right the whole time. Because the hippies were the ones telling us about freedom and blah, 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 and a lot of us were like, yeah, yeah, whatever, go away. Uh, and as it turns out, they were the ones who were right about this thing the entire time. They were right. And it's time that we sort of recognize that and learn how to apply that lesson to what we're doing in the future. Thank you. Cool. So I think uh, we have some time. I think we have about eight, seven minutes for questions. So I think if uh, there's a microphone and I'm supposed to listen in this thing, right? Uh, hello. Uh, I would like to know uh, which of those freedoms uh, Gmail complies and <laughs> so whenever I give this talk and this is kind of the second or third time I've given it I've refrained from criticizing specific services but I think it's safe to say that I can't think of a single service that uh, complies with the, you know, the four freedoms of the cloud that I listed I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pinpoint any one in particular I'm just gonna say at this point they all suck Thank you for the great talk. Uh, I would like to know uh, what do you think about the role of motivation uh, in software innovation? Motivation, as in what motivates people? Um, I think, as I, as, I, as I mentioned in the talk, you know, the, great, um, the great turning point was the leveling of the playing field where users became active participants. I think it's easy from the, from the user side, the motivation is they want a seat at the table to be able to influence direction and to be fully, you know, to have some ownership and, to, and some say in what happens. From the developer point of view, they want to access users. The, the, the most important thing a developer wants is a large number of users to say that they produce something of value to many people. And so I think the dynamic shifted uh, sometime in the late 90s to the point where if a developer wanted to do that, 
they had to play by open source rules. When you look at, take a look at the last 10 years at what has succeeded in the data center. I can't think of a single proprietary solution that has become ubiquitous in the last 10 years. When I ask this question, I think the only one that comes up is VMware. But VMware started, you know, well before 10 years ago. If, other than VMware, I can't think of a single proprietary solution. So I think the motivation here is, depending on where you're coming from, whether you're a user or a developer, if you're a developer, I think the motivation is you want to reach a maximum number of users. And if you're a user, you want to fully participate in the ecosystem. Uh, I was just wondering here, uh, for example, Java community. Java community, uh, in terms of how to drive, uh, how do I say, how, do, how to drive innovation in a, in a process uh, like Java community process, for example. Uh, I'm just giving Java community as an example and because I, I was wondering here how to, to make innovation happen in terms of heavily uh, committee designed process. Uh, because uh, I, I see you talking about open standards, but at some, at some point uh, I think that some projects evolve more, it has more innovation happening uh, with some kind of benevolent dictatorship than to have a heavily uh, community driven process. What do you think about this? What do you think about the mechanics of innovation happening on this context? I think there's more than one way to do it. I think that we, I've seen the benevolent dictatorship work. I've seen the design by committee work. It really depends on the personalities of the people involved. And you know, in, in my talk, I don't really get into that because I really talk about more on a macro level. But sure, within, within a project internally, it, it's all politics. It's all personalities. and. It, whichever one suits the developer is better is the one that's going to win out. Um, it, were, were you? Did you say documentation? Were you referring to, like, producing documentation, or are you talking? Oh, okay. Yes. Yes, and I think, I think the key to that is having these, the rules uh, in the beginning that you have to abide by. E everything beyond the rules is whatever each project wants to do. Uh, and it, as you mentioned, yes, open standards is essentially an agreement between multiple parties that they're going to adhere to you know, these standards. I think that's, that, you know, that, that sets about you know, sort of a ground rule that you have to abide by that makes sure that in the future uh, you know, developers can't come in and, and change it you know, to their benefit. I think, Mad Dog, do you have something you want to add to that? Yeah. That's yeah. That's that's a, so. The comment was, uh, you don't lead with standards. Standards are something that happens after the initial innovation. I think that's actually a really good point because I've, I have seen, I've seen lots of attempts to define standards that no one uses, and no one likes that. So I think yeah. I, I you know you adhere to the four freedoms. You 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 develop something new and exciting and then later on you have the ability to, to build on that and to define them as standards so that everyone else can participate. I think that's a very, very good point. Any other questions? Go on. Go once, going twice. Okay. Thank you everyone. It was really fun. <laughs>